Please remain standing as you're able. Join with me in the bottom of the inside portion of your bulletin in the prayer for overcoming adversity. Let us pray together. Lord, we pray not for tranquility, nor that our tribulations may cease. We pray for thy spirit and thy love, that thou grant us strength and grace to overcome adversity. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'm going to read from the Eugene Peterson translation of the message for Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12, these concluding part of the Beatitudes. Hear now the word of the Lord. You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. And not only that, count yourselves blessed every time people put you down or throw you out or speak lies about you to discredit me. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and they are uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens. Give a cheer even. For though they don't like it, I do. And all heaven applauds. And know that you are in good company. My prophets and witnesses have always gotten into this kind of trouble. This is the word of God for you and me, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated as we together lift our voices in this chorus in preparation and prayer. Oh God, we lift to you our voices in praise. We give you thanks for your faithfulness in our lives and ask for forgiveness for the ways in which we have clearly heard your call and failed to act. For we have been too busy. We could not discern the call of your spirit on our lives. And now may, oh God, may your spirit stand between me and your people so that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together will be shaped, formed, and molded into the good news of the gospel of Christ, in whose name we have gathered, in whose name we pray, and in whose name we will seek to serve faithfully. And all of God's people did say, Amen. There's an old joke that's told of a man who passes and goes to heaven, and when he gets there, St. Peter begins to give him the tour of heaven and this many mansions and many rooms as scripture speaks. And they're walking down a hallway and there's a doorway that's slightly ajar and the man leans in and looks and as he peers into the room he sees all manner and kinds of people dancing. Some doing the jitterbug, some waltzes, some doing the Bernie and the wobble, all kinds of things. The man turns to St. Peter with a perplexed look and he said, Church Christ, they weren't allowed to dance on earth. They're making up for it in heaven. <clears throat> they walk on a little further. He peers in through another door that's slightly ajar and he looks. And he's astounded to find 
that it's like a college party. I mean, people are drinking all kinds of alcohol and hard liquor. He's perplexed and he turns and he looks at St. Peter. He says, Baptist, they weren't allowed to drink publicly when they were on earth. They're making up for it in heaven. They walk a little further. The door's slightly ajar. He peers in. They're folk just sitting around doing nothing. They're just sitting there. They're not doing a single thing. They're just sitting there. The man looked at St. Peter, what's up with that? He said, that's the Methodist. There wasn't anything they couldn't do when they were on earth. (laughs) Now, how many of you have ever heard the phrase, well, Methodists, they believe anything, right? That's not true. That's not true. We, We do not believe everything and anything, okay? What we have been historically is a denomination that has had a greater tolerance for conversation and tension, primarily around issues of social issues and the tension that existed between, even in the last hundred years primarily, that goes back further than that if you want to talk about gravity, about science and truth and religion. We've been a part of that conversation. The problem is that the Methodist church has become a monument and it's failed to be a movement. We were never designed by God to be a monument. We were always designed to be a movement. And yet across the United States, beautiful steeples are beginning to have cobwebs because churches have increasingly forgotten that we aren't called just to assemble as God's people. We are called to move into the world to make a difference. And it's time for us as the people of God to reclaim this sense of being a movement birthed on the seashore of Galilee by one who had no place to lay his head, who turned the world not upside down, but right side up. But how did we get to where we are? We got to where we are in many ways because we have forgotten that our identity is found in these pages of Scripture, and we have forgotten the beauty that comes with being a people set apart by God to be in tension with the world in its social construct, and we have avoided persecution and discomfort, and we have clung to convenience and comfortableness. There was a time when the Methodist church was known because it engaged the world socially. It was John Wesley coming out of England who talked about a social holiness that accompanies a vital piety of belief, meaning that if you believed in God, you could not avoid loving your neighbor. It compelled you to love your neighbor. And then we began to be a... a, a denomination and a movement that participated socially. You could not have had the teetotalers and the temperance movement without the Methodist church because we had that structure across the fiber of this nation. In fact, do you know why we still use grape juice for communion? It goes all the way back to our hairs during Prohibition when the church struggled with the issue of alcohol and wine was used previously. And there's a man named Herbert who actually had a family that had the very first grape juice distillation or preservation plant. Pasteurization would be a pasteurization plant for grape juice. His last name was Welch. If you look in the front of a United Methodist book of discipline, you see the record of the bishops, Bishop Herbert Welch. And before he was Bishop Herbert Welch, he was Reverend Herbert Welch, and he was in charge of the Methodist social temperance movement in the United States. And we've just held on to Welch's ever since. Ever since. Now we do allow the use of wine within communion. And the Sunday that you show up for Holy Communion and you expect to get that nice little sweet taste of grape juice, and it's a little bit of a surprise because it's real wine. That's my last Sunday. You know I'm leaving. <laughs> but I want to do it. I want to do it. I want to feel a grape juice. I just, I just want, to, I want to put jalapeno juice in the bread. And I want to put real wine in the... I want communion to pack a punch when we get to it. Because how predictable is it? I mean, it's Hawaiian bread we use, and I can't find that in Scripture, but every Methodist church I've served, it's got to be Hawaiian bread, or it's got to be challah bread from the Jewish tradition, or if you use a flat bread, it's got to have lots of honey in it. We want everything to affect our appetite and our palate the same way our faith. We don't really want a challenge. 
We want a comforter. We want a, a God who will wrap around us like a nice, maybe, wool or fleece blanket on a deep November evening when the chill is in the air and just cuddle up. Well, friends, cuddling in a blanket never changed the world for anybody. And we move from that place of participating in the world socially to having attention with the world socially, seen most expressly in the Protestant movement of the church with Dietrich Bonhoeffer. An amazing life. The best summary you can read of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's life is in a book called The Seven. It's written by Eric Metaxas. And uh, it's a fantastic book. I'm indebted to my wife for buying that for me when she heard me refer to it. She saw it. It's got a brilliant summary of Bonhoeffer's life. He was a voice of the Christian confessing church in Germany against Hitler. And friends, the idea that Hitler was trying to co opt Christianity is a mistruth of history. He wanted to actually eradicate the Christian voice and create out of a a theological, meaning no theological construct, his own religious framework. He wasn't trying to hijack the church, and that's why Bonhoeffer was executed three weeks before the liberation of Germany. And now we've moved into a time where we seem to have lost our relevance as a church because the church is just one more voice in the world and everybody has their own opinion. And we're in this time period called postmodernism, where there is no real authority. We question authority everywhere. And for all the valuable ways that the social media has provided us a sense of accountability of what's happening in our world and sometimes to our own dismay, showing us what's happened not in us in the last year, but the last decade. We've lost our distinctiveness because as a church we want so badly to be liked, so badly to be accepted, so badly to be relevant that we've abandoned the faith. We have basically abandoned our faith. We have created a religious construct in this world where some places that it's more of a religious thing because there's a heaven without a hell, there's salvation without surrender, there's discipleship without commitment, there's faith without formation, there's forgiveness without, without any sense of repentance or turning, and there's Christianity really without Christ because you're Methodist, you can believe anything. And that's not true. We believe in Christ crucified. We believe in the historic faith of the church. It's contained in John Wesley's sermons. It's contained in our articles of religion. If we want to get back to who we are as a people of faith, then we must realize and we must embrace the reality that we live as Christ lived and we endure, as Hebrew says, because Christ endured and was faithful even to death upon a cross. We endure. We don't simply come to this place to feel better about what we're doing. And then we also have to be willing to stand firm in the faith. And when we stand firm in the faith, it means there's going to be a tension with the world around us. And the problem is we always talk about this cry of being relevant. My friends, I don't care if we use a screen. I don't care if you use a bulletin. I don't care if I wear a robe. I don't care if I wear skinny jeans. Everything across the spectrum. The church is not going to find its relevance in this world by how we do worship. We are missing the mark. We're going to be relevant when we finally decide to get off our rears and get into the world. We're going to be relevant in this world when we finally decide that the call of Christ is so compelling, and I'm almost afraid to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway, that we look at our committees and ask, are we just entertaining ourselves socially? Or are we gathered as a people that God forms and shapes to do something in the world? No life is changed because you came to church today. Not a single one. You think the church, the people who need to know the love of God really care where you are on Sunday morning? Go ahead, check in on Facebook and all your friends that go to church. Well, that's nice. We worship at First Baptist. We worship at First Press. We worship at Hillside. We worship at St. Stephen's. This is a time for us to get together, to encourage one another. And at the very least, we ought to ask that historic question of John Wesley, have we felt that sense of being persecuted? 
I mean, the only way I know to do this is if there's not some point in your life in faith, you're not taken back to seventh grade cafeteria, sitting alone, wondering what everybody else is thinking, maybe you're not following Jesus. Can you get that simple? Do you remember what that felt like? Because you were so concerned about what everybody thought about you. Where are you going to sit? But we just want to be relevant. We want people to get along. And then we fall into this trap that has nothing to do with a gospel proclamation, has only to do with make us feel better about being less impactful in the world. Oh, I just don't want to offend anybody. After all, you can believe what you believe, and I can believe what I believe, and, and, and we're all okay together. My friends, that is American religious ethic that is not biblical faith. We are not called to make each other feel comfortable. We are called to spur one another on to faithfulness, to acts of love. So how is it that we embody this beatitude of understanding we are called to be the ones that make a difference in the world, to endure? We stand firm in the faith. We embrace what God said to Moses in Exodus chapter 14. Do not be afraid. Stand firm. We embrace what Paul said in Corinthians, to stand firm in the faith. And then we go deeper into the words of the prophet, and historically and biblically, when you look at the prophet's call of God's people historically, you will never find a single prophet from Isaiah, Jeremiah, Nathan, Obadiah, Amos, Jonah. You won't find a single prophet saying, people of faith, be more relevant, adapt to culture. Have you ever read that? I haven't ever read that. I read things like, let righteousness flow down like an ever-flowing stream. I read things of a prophet who calls people back. And so here's the call that I think is good for you and me to hear today from the prophet Jeremiah. If you want to write it down, it's chapter 6, verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your soul. We've stopped asking to look backward into the faith and the heritage that has been given to us in the Scriptures, and we think that we are the ones who are relevant, and we can just create what we want to be comfortable with each other. God never called us to be comfortable. He called us to be faithful. And the great news of the gospel in the midst of all this challenge is that literally it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the world thinks of us when we know what God thinks of us. So in Chicago, you, you get on this thing called the L train. I think some of you have been there, right? I mean, I was on the blue train and you get on and I counted at one point 17 out of 24 people at the Rosemont station had earphones on or headphones on. They had no desire to engage with the world. More than that, when they sit down, they don't make eye contact. It was so easy to pick out who we were as the tourists to Chicago because we didn't bring our earphones or headphones, but we also had this long line of people behind that little machine that says, hey, can you tell me what kind of ticket I need? Yeah, yeah we got a few glares. We felt like the persecuted for a little bit. But I was amazed I sat there and, and you travel along and you sit right next to people just like this. You sit right next to people <laughs> and the train's going along. And you never even say hi until the train stops and it's in the tunnel. And the train stopped and it was in the tunnel, and there was a woman who was standing there, and I didn't know what she was looking at. She literally was just looking out the window all the time. Even when we're in the tunnel, she just looked right out the window. No eye contact. I think it's a rule for Chicagoans. And the train stops. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're, we've got an uh, emergency on the track ahead of us. We, we'll be here a few minutes. And she lets go of the post since the train isn't moving, and she literally was banging her head against the plastic. No, no. Everybody's, well, that's pretty fascinating. So I just got up. We're from Texas. I just got up. 
I said, does that hurt? <laughs> she started to smile. She said, no, not really. I said, hey, can you tell I'm not from around here? She said, I figured that out. <laughs> I said, how? She said, we don't talk to each other on the train. I said, well, what's all this mean? And suddenly there was a conversation that started. Lived in Chicago for seven or eight years. She was riding her job. We'll be okay. And you know what happened after one conversation started? Then suddenly over here, Paul Byron, finally district superintendent, started talking to the person across from him. And then Rick Enns, who was first Kenyan, started talking to the person. We had a conversation in a train in Chicago. Now, I know that's not going to change anybody's life. But for me, as I thought about this text, about the... I refuse to be a church or pastor a church or be a part of a church that only is going to sit in the cable car, train car with its headphones on and not engage the world because we don't make a difference when we do that. I want to be a part of a church that chooses to make a difference, a church that will respond to a random email that says, I've got a former student who's got two kids, a single mom, and she needs some help to things to be moved. I want to be part of a church that says, okay, we can do that. Let's get some people together, some trucks, and let's go help her move Sunday afternoon. I want to be a part of a church that says, let's make a difference in the world when there's hunger. We decide to do something about the hunger that's there. I want to be a part of a church that says that for all the tensions about understanding immigrants, the last time I checked, it doesn't matter the color of your skin or what kind of language you speak, everybody's blood runs red. I want to be the kind of church that sees people for people. I want to be the church that stands with those who are beaten down and lifts them up. I want to be the kind of church that celebrates that we serve and love a God who will never let us go. I want to be the kind of church that remembers that when Adam hid, God found him. That even though Isaac was a dreamer, God still used him. Even though Moses avoided God, avoided God and said, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a stutterer, God, I can't do it, God used him. I want to be a part of a church that serves a God like Jonah runs and God finds him, even in whale vomit on a beach, and he sweeps him up and cleans him off. I don't care how bad the feedlots smell, whale vomit's got to smell just like it. I want to be a part of a church that knows a God of redemption and redeeming and calling. Even when people like David come to power, it goes to their head. They have an affairs. They have murder to cover things up, and God still redeems them. I want to be a part of a church that even though we've got cowards like Gideon hiding from the world, God calls us from the place of hiding to be a leader. I want to be the kind of church that God calls persons like Martha, who was nothing but a warrior, and finds a way to weave her into the work that happens Zacchaeus was short and it didn't matter. God found him in a tree. I want to be a part of a church that reminds us that God never leaves us. He didn't leave Paul. He didn't leave Tom. He didn't leave Timothy. He didn't leave the disciples. And when the world put Christ in the tomb for three days, he didn't leave Jesus in the tomb. He rose him for the dead so that you and I can be instruments of that life-giving kind of work in the world. But I promise you, the world as exhibited in our current political process is infatuated and loves to fester and feed debate and beating people down. We're called to be the church and not to beat people down, but to bring people up. And when we do that, the world will not like it. And you may feel uncomfortable. So if today all you're doing is living in comfort, like look at your pews. Kevin, we're going to take all the comforters out of the pews just to make them uncomfortable, right? That was Kevin's idea. Let's get a little uncomfortable, church. Let's move outside of our comfort zones. Jesus didn't say, take up your cross and have a nice day. What is it? It's the world that tells us, let's be comfortable. Here's a test for you, and I'm going to close with this. How many of you, given a choice in Amarillo, Texas, would buy a vehicle, assuming you had the ability to buy a vehicle with air conditioning and heat, or not with air conditioning and heat. Raise your hand if you would buy the vehicle without air conditioning and heat. By the way, it's called a tractor. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't, would you? Because everything about our culture is about controlling our climate. We've got to get over thinking 
that faith is about climate control for our soul. It's not. It's not. If you're real comfortable, I just ask you historically the question of Wesley. How is it with your soul? Let us pray. God, as we think about what it means to follow Christ in this world today, as we ponder our own walk with Christ, as we've loved you with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we ask that you would forgive us for the ways that we have created a religious construct full of human rationale that insulates us from the great and high calling of Christ Jesus. I pray that you would forgive us in the ways in which we have confused comfort with commitment. I pray that you will help us as a church together and collectively to look into what we're doing, why we're doing it, and asking the question, is it making a difference in the world to reach people for the love of Jesus Christ? God, where it is not, give us the courage to stop. To stop amusing ourselves with our own delusions and where we need to find a bold courage to step forward. Help us choose to be people who live in the spirit of Jeremiah, who take this moment to look back to the ancient ways, to stand and look in the good path that leads to a place that is good for our soul. Help us to stand firm and know that you are God who will never let us go. We pray these things in the name of Christ. And all of God's people did say, Amen.